One rather broad way that one could choose to categorize games has to do with the game's relationship to its subject. Now that can be on a continuum, of course, um, how much veracity a game has, but uh, there, there's a, a broad um, split in games between those that are more predominantly concerned with the gameplay and those that are more predominantly concerned with uh, their subject. Sienna is an odd sort of game in that it kind of straddles the two uh, in part because what it chooses to simulate or what it chooses as its subject is um, something in itself that is not necess not an event it's not um, not a, not a, uh, things that people do or a certain action or or anything like that, but rather it's an inanimate object. Um, Sienna takes as its subject a painting. Or, perhaps more specifically, two paintings. On the right here we have the Sienna countryside, and then on the left we have the town of Sienna itself. Now the paintings are included um, as the board, and you actually play on the painting somewhat, but they are actually um, not necessary to play the game. There are tracks where you actually get the relevant information and there are spaces on the board are kind of demarcated here. So whereas the game doesn't really show its markings, there are very particular areas. So um, when you start the game you are a peasant, all the players are peasants, and you're making you're making crops and selling crops from these different areas. So the the three different areas that peasants sell from are I'm marking with these cubes here. Okay, and they're just kind of I mean really blotches. You could but you could have five different boxes because later on there's going to be two more boxes opened up when players become merchants. Um, you don't necessarily need the painting. But the painting does give the whole entirety of feel and it helps to see the um inspiration of the designer. So he's kind of He's kind of presenting his source uh, for, for the work, even as you engage with the work itself. Like a bibliography. So, like I said, players begin the game as peasants, but they do not remain peasants because their goal is to become one of the Council of Nine of the town of Siena. So, when they get to a certain amount of resources, 30, uh, that's not going to be on a test or anything, you don't have to remember that, but it's 30. Um, amounts of money, they can opt, and that's an option. They don't have to do it because there might be some reasons not to, and this is one of the, the fulcrums of the game. Uh, they can opt, and it's an option, they can opt to um, become a merchant. And then, once they're a merchant, after they get to a certain amount, and that amount is 80, uh, they can opt, and it's an option, to become a banker. And if they're a banker at the end of the game, they have a shot of becoming one of the Council of Nine. Sienna is a card-driven game. Uh, each round of turns begins with drawing and displaying a number of these Sienna cards equal to twice the number of players. Now if we take a look at one of these cards here, and maybe we'll look at some more if you're lucky, uh, you'll see that it's not necessarily self-explanatory. This is one of the barriers to playing this game is the cards don't really say what they do. Um, however, once you play it, it's, it's really quite simple. It's not as hard a game as it makes itself out to be. Um, so as we see here, we have different pictures. Um, these are segments of the mural that uh, let you know where, uh, where, what, what's affected. Really though, when you play, you're going to be looking at this side more. This is, actually ends up being more like flavor text. So yellow would be corn. Red would be uh, whatever the red crop is, and six, uh, the blue would be um, the blue crop. I don't remember what they are. Then, uh, um, so this is this bottom part here is going to be uh, relevant to the peasants or the merchant. The top part, um, the red number is relevant to everyone. That's the cost of the card. Uh, however, in this game, it's got a balancing mechanism. So if you're ahead, you're going to have to pay a, an additional. Uh, amount for a card. And then this green number, they say it's green, it's kind of an olive green I guess, um, is relevant to the banker. That's one of the fun things about these cards uh, in, in relation to 
uh, the various roles. So in general it's better to be a banker than to be a merchant, and it's better to be a merchant than to be a peasant. However, it really depends on what all the other players are doing. Because the banker is mainly worried about this top number, right? But whenever the banker plays one of these cards, the bottom effects still come into play. Whereas with, if a peasant were to play one of these cards, it would help the merchant, because this is a merchant crop, these are peasant crops, uh, but the banker wouldn't get any extra movement. So it can be a benefit to be the only peasant in the game, though eventually you're going to have to be a banker if you want to be a member of the Council of Nine. So let's take a quick look at what the peasant can do in the game. Peasant is going to be playing cards to fill up these tracks, right? If you get a yellow card and it has a one on it, you would put one cube there. If you fill up the, the yellow track, you can put a corn out, and then you can immediately sell one of those corns a turn. Um, so you're, you're, you're oftentimes going to be hoarding cards until you have an opportunity to fill up a track and then take um, what's there. Now there is a hand limit, however, so that can be tricky. And that's all the peasant's really doing is he's uh, growing things and selling them. Thus, is a, such is a peasant's life. The merchant is doing a similar thing except he's got these longer tracks and they're worth more points. Um, the merchant also can go on this little side thing here, um, which is inspired by this portion of the painting. So there's uh, there's lots of little, uh, I guess I'd say chrome in this game, uh, where it's like there's extra things that are other than the main sort of goal that are just because it's in the painting, and also because it makes it a more interesting game. Adds a little bit of complexity and a few more decisions. Um, so anyway, you can, you can go travel and get more money there. Um, but one thing that's different about the merchant and the peasant, and this is one thing that's nice about being a merchant, is when a merchant makes a sale, the merchant can decide to um, make the sale for cheaper in order to get these victory point cards. And these victory point cards are actually called consent in this game. So really you're, you're kind of bribing the populace to kind of like you more so that they'll vote you to be the uh, member of the Council of Nine. Um, and the merchant can get quite a few cards that way. Now once a player becomes a banker, the game changes quite a bit. Uh, first of all, as a banker, you just get you get a steady income every turn. Um, also, every time a merchant makes a sale, you're going to get some extra income. Mainly what you're doing as a banker, however, is you're moving around town in a clockwise manner. Um, and you're always going to move one a turn, but you can choose to play more cards, like this would move you six more, um, to move further. And why would you want to do that? Because different spaces do different things. Um, so most, a lot of them will get you money. Any of the yellow ones will get you money. Um, these, these brown ones, if you have saved a card from the beginning of the game, likely, um, these are cards that are auctioned. They, they will, um, you'll get to even more money that way. Same with this one, uh, but it uses this special fate deck that has a devil in it. Um, then there's, what else? There's, oh, you can go here and you can auction off artists. The last of the artists to be auctioned, by the way, is the artist of the mural himself, Ambrosio Lorenzetti. So that's kind of an interesting little cycle there. Um, you can go to a wedding. You can donate a bunch of money in order to get some victory point cards. Um, oh, and the artists are all worth victory points. And then you can also build the Tower de Del Mangia. And, you know, once the tower's finished, the game's over. Or when Ambrosio is found, um, the game is finished. Uh, and depending on you know how many levels of the tower you built and what level you built and how high up it is and whatnot, you get a certain amount of consent. And so that's basically what the banker's doing, is just going in circles and trying to avoid Calendrino. Calendrino, here's his card, is a beggar uh, in the game. And basically when he, he reaches you, he takes some money. I never found him to be too big of a problem. Uh, if you refuse him, he uh, you get... Um, a cruel, a spite token, I think, which is worth minus one consent because people see that you're mean to Calandrino. Uh, but Calandrino also, to me, is sort of the, the vessel into the painting. He feels like, almost like a ghost, uh, continually moving around in a uh, counterclockwise fashion in the past, in 1345 or whenever this uh, takes place. Um, and I kind of wish the game were more about Calandrino, though maybe if it were, uh, he'd have less of an effect. His sort of, um, his otherliness seems to fit with the whole, the, the, the feel evoked from the game, which is 
which is more just the uh, relating to the act of of somewhat interacting with the painting rather than the mechanisms involved. Sienna is a game that mechanically seems to belong to the, the gameplay focus side of the divide that I, I uh, mentioned earlier in this video. Um, however, I think it also uh, belongs in, in a way, in a, in a strange way, to the, um, the lineage of games that is concerned with history, in that it, um, it takes as its, its subject uh, a piece of history. Now, it doesn't take as its subject uh, the events of history at all. The the idea, I think, that uh, two to five peasants could work their way up to to being merchants and then bankers within a lifespan seems seems um, very difficult. Though perhaps it's family based, but even then, I I, I feel like people. Um, in medieval times were kind of stuck in their station for the most part. Um, but it takes, it takes as its subject a painting from history and brings it to a sort of life. Uh, it's, you know, you stop at wedding processions and you, you, um, you have to avoid prostitutes and there's Calandrino. Um, does it do that perfectly? I don't think so. Has it succeeded in making a game that a board game where the spaces are a painting. I don't think so either. I think you, it, you need you kind of play the edge of the board rather than the painting itself when you're playing. But it does succeed in um, creating uh, a space with which to interact with this painting, and you kind of maybe feel the painting more than you would if you were to just look at it. I think what is even more important about Siena is where it's placed itself in the history of games. The idea behind it, the, the, the doors it's opened in terms of what can be the subject of a game, what can be the subject of a work, which, which I, I feel is rather closed. There's, there are, there's a huge world of things that games could be about, but we, we're designers, not we, because I guess we're not all making games, but you should. Um, we are, the, the designers, are just making uh, games about a, a handful of topics. Um, and Sienna.